Hey, thank you guys for watching this week's message from Pastor Marty Tackett. We just want to let you know that if you would like to partner with our ministry, you can do so. Um, you can give on our church website, and that is lvachurch.com. Simply click the Give button on the top right of the screen. You will then be directed to our Secure Give website. Click Donate, and then follow the on-screen instructions to complete your donation. Well, let's get into today's uh, message for a little while here. I want to, uh, I'm going to start a new 27-week uh, series. No, it's not going to be 27, be 28. But um, I don't know how long it'll last. I, I never, I usually have a two or three in, in, in lined up when I start a series, but I do want to start a series. I love series because we can dig a lot out of, out of a series. And uh, so today I want, to, I want to start a series called Living Like Elijah. Living like Elijah. Now, I know some of you that, that know a little bit about Elijah, you went to some of those great moments in his life, and then some of you that really know a little bit more about Elijah, you say, well, he was a depressed guy. Uh-huh. Well, he was that too. But uh, there's so much in what we're going to learn over the next few weeks on, out of this series of living like Elijah. And so uh, I want to start with a, a definition of his name. Now, as you know, um, he, he didn't pick his name like you didn't pick your name. Uh, Elijah simply means, uh, my God is Jehovah. And some of you say, well, that's great. Well, what does Jehovah mean? Well, Jehovah is the proper name in, in the Hebrew of God. So let me, let me give you a little explanation. And so, because I'm going to teach you today, and I'm going to preach to you and with you and at you and on you, because uh, Ralph's here, and I'm going to preach on Ralph a little bit. Uh, no, uh, Ralph's my buddy. I, I tell you, he's a, uh, he's a great encourager. He calls me every week to encourage me uh, in one shape, form, or fashion. Sometimes just to rip me a little bit, but most of the time it's to encourage me. And uh, so I always have to pick with him. But Jehovah, uh, Jehovah simply means God. And so if you look at uh, the terminology, some of the names of God, you'll see Jehovah and then you'll see another name, another word. And I'll give you a few examples. And uh, number one is Jehovah Nisi. Nisi means my banner. So if you say Jehovah Nisi, you're really saying God is my banner, okay? So you say God is my banner. Then another one is Jehovah Rapha, which means he's my healer. So you got God is my healer. Okay, uh, an, another, another word of, of Jehovah is Jehovah Jireh, which means provider. So you got God is my provider. So when you look at Elijah's name, really, are you, he's saying really, my God is everything I need. Because there's eight, name, eight, five other names of God. Uh, there's the, the protector uh, that, that you also hear of, uh, Jehovah Shalom, which is peace. And so when you look at these names in, in the biblical times, they, they're significant. We read over them so quickly and say, okay, that sounds, that's a cool name. It's a weird name. Can't spell it. Move on. But really, what he's saying is, my God is what I need him to be. Now, here's the deal. He's not what you need him to be because you need him to be something. He is what he is, whether you need him to be or not. He's already that. He's already a healer. He's already peace. He's already a provider. He's already a protector. He's already, already a banner. Whether you need him or not, he's already that. But just so you know, if you get close to God and get connected to God, when you need him to be that specific thing in your life, he's already that. That's good. So you don't have to wait for him to grow into it, to grow up, to evolve into what you need him to be. He's already that. He's just waiting on you to call on him to say, Lord, this is what I need this week. He says, I'm already that. You're going to learn. We're going to learn that Elijah, we're going to learn that Elijah needed God to be many things in his life at many different times and sometimes several things at the same time. So watch this. <clears throat> It's very interesting that, that, that you, you, when you hear about Elijah, we always go to the miracles, right? We hear of Elijah and Elisha. That's the first couple of things that come to mind. Which one came first? Who is which? You know, is it Elijah, Elisha, which one? I can't ever keep them straight. And so we get confused, but we know that they revolve around what? Miracles. Because everybody likes the supernatural. Everybody likes the miracle. Everybody likes the yoo-hoo and the yahoo. Right? 
So watch this, so this is interesting that I find something about Elijah in the book of James. Now the book of James um, is an epistle. You said it's epistle. No, it's epistle, an epistle. Epistle simply means it's an instructional book on how to live a Christian life. So we find Elijah appears in James chapter five, verse 17. And watch what it says about James, in James 5, 17 about Elijah. Elijah was a man of, with a nature like ours. Now I thought right off the bat, now wait a minute, the Elijah I know is a miracle working guy. That's Elijah, I'm thinking, well, I'm, me and Elijah, we don't have the same nature here right off the bat, okay? But we're talking about living like Elijah. James, it's interesting that James is teaching a group of believers about 40 years after the death and resurrection of Christ in a little small village, and he's saying, hey, they're, they're persecuted, uh, they're, they're trying to be stomped out of their Christianity, their faith, and even though it's only about 40 years, they're trying to rid them, and so this Christian thing is trying to take off, and there's little pockets all over, uh, the, all over Asia and different places, okay? And so he's saying, hey, you remember Elijah, right? He's just like we are. His nature is just like us. Well, I looked up nature because I want to know really what this means. This word nature, uh, it means that, that, that he has the same desires and passions and disappointments and dislikes and likes and struggles that we do. I said, wait a minute now. That ain't the Elijah I know. I think about the other Elijah. The Elijah didn't have any problems. The Elijah that was on fire for God. The Elijah that called down fire from heaven. That's, that's the Elijah I was thinking of. It's the same Elijah. Watch. It says he was, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Now we're talking about living like Elijah. Watch what he did. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain for three years and six months. I remember that, Elijah. It's a miracle, right? You remember those. Watch this. And then verse 18 says, and he prayed again. And heaven gave rain and the earth pro produced its fruit. So what's so interesting to me when I'm reading scripture and I've been studying about Elijah, what's so interesting is 40 years after Christ, 500, 600 years after Elijah's death, he's still being referred to as, hey, new church, you ought to follow what he does because he's just like us. What he did, we ought to do. We ought to live like Elijah because he had the same struggles you're going through. And we ought to live, we ought to use him as a, as a benchmark, as a basis. So if Elijah had the same desires, he had the same struggles, he had the same passions, he had the same disappointments, he had the same frustrations, he had the same, dis, uh, the same distortions that we have, uh, the crazy thoughts that we have, tell me again what part we need to follow that's like Elijah. Because I know me better than I know anybody. And me gets crazy. Me has some crazy thoughts. Me does some crazy things. Now, I know I'm pointing to me, but you can point to you. I mean, we're supposed to be like that, right? Talking about living like Elijah. Come on, you're gonna get something out of this today. I'm gonna lay some foundation. You don't wanna miss the next few weeks of this because it's gonna get more gooder and more gooder. <laughs> so, if we're supposed to model our life after Elijah, so let's find some things that we kinda like to model ourselves like because I got several of them already down very good. All right, I got a lot of them down, okay? But here's some, I wanna, I wanna name three of them. We're gonna talk about each one of these in a minute. The first thing that he did that we find in James chapter five, verse 17, says that he prayed. So when we look at Elijah's life for today only, we're going to, we're gonna look at three areas. We're gonna look at pray, obey, and trust. Pray, obey, and trust. Those are three areas that James, the half-brother of Jesus, supposedly, is trying to teach this group of young Christians, hey, live like he did. We ought to pray, we ought to obey, we ought to trust, okay? So if you're going to live like Elijah, we must pray like Elijah, we must obey like Elijah, and we must trust like Elijah. That's where it gets tough. We want to be like Elijah, but we don't want to pray like Elijah, we don't want to obey like Elijah, and we don't want to trust like Elijah. That's a, that takes my Christian walk to a whole new level when I got to start doing stuff. 
It's one thing to be on the team. When I was in uh, junior high, I played a little football, not much football. I was more of the, you know, I had a little more finesse. I didn't want to go out there and get this beat up. <laughs> I didn't play a lot of junior high football. And so therefore, when I didn't play a lot of football, I wasn't one of the people that the coach really wanted to play a lot. Because I might play a little bit and, and, and this year and I didn't play for a year or so. And, and so I remember in my ninth grade year, where well, we were going from the ninth grade to high school, uh, we were in, in, um, in Phillips County, Arkansas, in Helena. And uh, I thought, man, I'm, I'm gonna play. I'm, I don't play my high school years, I'm gonna play. So I'm there and, and uh, we'd practice and the coach would let me play quite a bit and I was playing cornerback. Uh, but I didn't start now, I was just, I was playing, you know. And uh, so I'm on the bench, uh, walking the sidelines. That's the sad thing about football, they don't have benches, they need any benches for people who don't play. And that stuff's heavy. Anyway, so, uh, so I'm on the sideline and I remember the coach said, hey, tack it! Yeah, coach. Get in the game. Mm. At that moment, every play, everything I was supposed to do, I went blank. <laughs> you know, they teach you if this, you, if you see this, you gotta go do this is a run play, if you see this is a pass play, you do all these different things, you gotta, you gotta come up here and do this. And I'm thinking, oh man, I just forgot everything. I forgot everything. You know why? Because I really didn't play too much. I was a practice dummy. You know what I'm saying? I was there to fill a spot and get run over when necessary and needed to make the other guys that were really good feel good about themselves. Come on, let's be real. I wonder how many of us in church are practice dummies. Oh, I could preach for a week right there. Living like Elijah, see, we want to live like, like we want to live like the superstar on a football team. Come on now. But we don't want to practice, see you guys like me. I didn't want to commit every year. I didn't want to commit to the off season going to the gym. I didn't want to commit to doing all that stuff. I just want to be on the team so I could get in the pepper, so I could get candy on Friday and the cheerleaders would, woo, look at you. Are you with me? Didn't make any sense whatsoever? Are you on the team? Are you living like Elijah? Or do you want to live like Elijah? Or are you just a practice dummy? Watch this. Now, I wanna, I've got to explain a few things uh, to you. We're going to go to 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. Now, uh, man, this is such cool stuff. Uh, Elijah, the first time you ever hear of Elijah is 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. First time he comes on the scene, he pops on the scene, and he is the man. Do you hear me? But that leads us, uh, it leads us into a bunch of series, though, because we've got to figure out why he's the man. But today we're going to establish a few things. In 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, now watch this. Uh, Elijah was so powerful in his ministry, he only had a ministry for 10 years. Let me, but let me rephrase. He only had a public ministry for 10 years. He only had the, the pastoral role for 10 years. He only had the superstar quarterback role for 10 years. There was a lot of stuff going on way before he showed up on the scenes if you're going to live like Elijah, there's some behind-the-scenes stuff you got to do before you can live like Elijah. So Elijah shows up on the scene in 1 Kings 17, 1, and, and I want to break down this verse. It's going to take me a minute, but it's going to set the precedence for the rest of the series. It says, and Elijah the Tishabite of the inhabitants of Gilead. Now, I read that and think, man, that's a mouthful. This guy must be important to have this kind of title or this kind of stuff around his name, right? So as I was reading, here's, let me, let me break that down to you in Southeast Arkansas terminology. Basically what it's saying when it says, Elijah the Tishabite of the inhabitants of Gilead, it's like saying, um, Marty of Lake Village of Chico County. Because Mount Gilead was just a region Tishib was a, was a little, was a little a community that they believed he was from, the Tishabite. And so basically what he's saying, he ain't nobody. I know that's great English. He ain't a nobody. Or he is a nobody. From a little place over here, and nobody really cares. But somebody put a bunch of stuff in his name to make him feel important. That's what we want to do. We want to put a lot of accolades with us of what we've done, but we really ain't that important because we're not living like Elijah. 
So 1 Kings 17, 1 says, after the inhabitants of Gilead, says, and he said to Ahab, now that's very important. What he just did is really important. He said to Ahab, and you say, well, what's the big deal about Ahab? Well, let me explain to you a little bit about Ahab. I know I'm laying foundation, but you've got to have a good foundation before you can build a house on, right? So watch this. So uh, Elijah shows up on the scene, hadn't been heard of. He pops in. Now Ahab is a king. Ahab is a king of Israel. Get, let me give you a breakdown, okay? So, um, so you back up. You got Saul, which is the first king, Okay. Now, Saul's the first king over all the 12 tribes, what they would call Israel, okay? So 12 tribes. All right, then, then 40 years later, Saul dies. You know the story. We typically think King David took over then. That's, not, that's technically not true. King David took over one tribe named Judah. Ishabeth, uh-huh, his mama didn't like him when he named him that. Ishabeth, which was Saul's son, we think of only Jonathan, right? But there was another son, Ishabeth, and he took over as king for two years over the other 11 tribes. So you got Ishabeth for two years, ruler or king over 11 tribes. You got King David over one tribe, Judah, for two years. Well, what happens is Ishabeth gets killed. He gets assassinated, and everybody loved David. Everybody. So all of a sudden they made David the king over all 12 tribes. So David reigns for 40 years. After that, Solomon, David's son, reigns for another 40 years over the 12 tribes. When Solomon's reign comes to an end, there's something very interesting that happens. It's leading up to this point. When Solomon dies, it rains comes in, there's the, the kingdom, the, what we call the kingdom of Israel, the, the kingdom, they're split in two halves. You got a northern kingdom and you got the southern kingdom. Now, the southern kingdom, if you want to look at it, is the good part. The northern kingdom, not so good, okay? So, in the southern kingdom, what you would have is you had, uh, um, you had uh, Judah and Benjamin, that's the two tribes that were in the south, or yeah, in the south. And the northern, you had the other 10. Now, from that moment on, where we typically start keeping up with the kings, there was 40 kings on north and south, southern Israel. 19 in the south, uh, 19 in the north, 19 in the south, and the south had one queen. Did you know that? Israel had a queen. Yeah, she was about number eight, number nine, number 10, somewhere in there. And, and so, they had, so they had all these kings. Now, out of all those kings, now, the, now I told you the southern king was the, was the best kingdom, right? It was like the, the, the good one. Out of all the, 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 the 20 rulers, only eight of them were good. The rest of them were evil. None in the north were good at all. They were all bad. I mean, they were hellions, if you will. Do you hear me? There were some of them kids y'all raised at y'all's house, them kind of kids, them bad ones, okay? <laughs> I had to wake y'all up because y'all like, I'm laying a foundation, so watch me. So we, we come to this place where, a, uh, where Ahab is the seventh king in the northern kingdom, and he is a bad, bad dude. He's wicked. He hates you because you looked at him. He hate if you said, if, if the word Christian came out of your mouth, boom, cut your head off, kill you right on the spot, ask no questions. He just didn't like you. He was trying to get rid of anything that had to do with anything about God, about Christ. I mean, he wanted to wipe off his mouth. Sounds a whole lot like today. That's it. It's the Holy Spirit tapping on somebody's heart. So, uh, so, so he, he, he tried to annihilate anything that had to do with Christianity. I mean, he was bad. It kind of sounds like today, doesn't it? They want to do away with everything that has anything to do with God. It's not that they didn't believe that there was a God, really. Because if they didn't believe, they wouldn't be doing all this stuff. So they believed that God had some kind of supernatural power, and he was omniscient, om omnipresent. He was ready to rule and reign. But they see, he says, hey, I'm king, so I'll kill you. So watch this. I'm going to tell you how bad he was. If you go to 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 30, it'll be on the screen. I'm going to read four, four passages of Scripture so you can understand how bad Ahab was. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord. 
more than all who were before him. Did you catch that? He was the most wicked king to this point. Worse than anyone before him. One commentary that I read said he was worse than all of them combined. The Bible just teaches that he was worse than any other. I guess you could read that in a couple of different ways. It says in verse 31, it says, And it came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the sons of Nebet. That's a husband. He was a bad dude. They were all just, they were just sinful. It was just trivial. It didn't mean anything to him. He regarded no, uh, no righteousness. It was just a trivial thing. It meant nothing to him to walk in sin. Not only did he walk in sin to poke God in the eye, so to speak, this is what he did. That he, uh, and he also took Jezebel, the daughter of Ethabel, the king of the Sidonians, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. He's a bad dude, wickedly. Verse 32 says, Then he set up an altar in Baal, in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And verse 33, And Ahab made a wooden image, and Ahab, listen, Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. I don't know about you. It's one thing to, to, to be in sin and walk in sin, but it's another thing to provoke God to anger. We've never really provoked God to anger here. If you do, let me know. We got a special place for you. I'm going to send you down to David's house. And, uh, that's how bad he was. He didn't care about God. He pointed his finger in the face of God and says, I'll do what I want to. I'll provoke you to anger. You won't do anything to me. Can you imagine Ahab standing there beating his chest? He's a king. He's got, got some authority, got some power. Now he's got the big head. Now I hope I've laid a little foundation. We got this little guy named Elijah. Nobody ever heard of. Especially in that realm of the kingship. He walks up to Ahab and says, hey, I got something to tell you. Can you imagine the scene? Ahab's like, who is this guy? And what does he want? I can just imagine his entourage saying, I really don't know. He, would, I did, he ain't on the guest list. <laughs> Let's check him out. So he says, I'm just making this up. What do you got to say, Ahab? That leads us to verse 1, back up to verse 1, 1 Kings 17, 1. And Elijah, the Tishabite of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab, that old wicked man, you know, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand. Now, I've been studying this, and this is cool right here. When Elijah made that statement, he says, hey, the Lord God of Israel lives. I told you about the northern southern kingdom, right, and all the spit and all that stuff. Guess what? He's making an announcement that God's about to show back up on the scene and be king of kings and lord of lords in the north and the south. That's what he's fixing. He's making an announcement to say, hey, before whom I stand, he wasn't even acknowledged that Ahab was the king. Talking about poking him in the face. You going to live like Elijah? Oh, you better trust like Elijah. You better pray like Elijah because he didn't show up on the scene. We're going to learn in a few weeks. He didn't show up on the scene ready to do this without praying and obeying and trusting. So he shows up and he says, hey, I'm standing in the presence of an omnipresent God. I know he's not physically here, but he is here. And I don't acknowledge who you are. You're no longer king. He's like, I'm going to pull the kingship from you right now. Oh, you don't know who I am? Well, just hang tight a few weeks. Because things are about to change. And in about three and a half, four years, your life is, oh, I'm sorry, you won't live in three and a half, four years. You'll be dead. Makes him mad. So watch this. And then Elijah gives a prophetic word because he's a prophet. Gives a word. Says, hey, king, I don't care how good you are, you don't control what I'm fixing to tell you. From this moment on, when I pray, there'll be no rain nor, nor dew, D-E-W, till I say it will again, 
Till I pray again, I'm telling you, King, just mark it down. You better start getting all your little vessels. You better put up some water because it's going to get dry. Now, I don't know about you, but we're talking about living like Elijah to pray and obey and trust. At this point, I'm just kind of thinking that you better really be prayed up because you done poked the so to speak, the king in the face, and then you don't give a prophetic word, say so you don't even acknowledge him, and it's gonna, not going to rain, and he ain't nothing good about it. Because see, Baal was, a, was also one of the Baal gods, was a, was a, a god that, that basically, if you will, that covered and handled and you prayed to for rain and sun and wind and all those things. So not only is he saying, I'm standing in the presence of my God, your God, can't even measure up to my God. Isn't this cool? It's some good stuff. So if you're going to live like Elijah, you better be praying like Elijah, and you better be obeying like Elijah, and you better be, yep, trusting like Elijah. So let me read you a little bit of commentary about what was happening right now, and I'm going to move on. Um, one of the historians and, and commentators wrote this. It says, it was a crucial time in the history of Israel. It looked as if the worship of the true God might be completely eliminated in the northern kingdom. The land swarmed with the priests of Baal and, and of Groves, uh, proud of the court favor, glorying in their sudden rise to power, insolent, greedy, uh, and debased. The fires of persecution were lit and began to burn with fury. The whole land seemed apostate. All of, the, uh, all, of all the thousands of Israel, only 7,000 remained who did not bow a knee or kiss the hand of Baal. Now, I, did, I don't know how many actually was living in the kingdom in, in Israel at that time, but all but 7,000, that's not very many. Are you with me? Now, now, now if I had a map, uh, we're talking about three or 400 miles from the top of the kingdom to the bottom of the kingdom. Probably 100, 150 miles wide. A lot of people there. Uh, Jerusalem's there. Bethlehem's there. A lot, a lot of major Damascus. All that's in, in this region. A lot of people. A lot of stuff going on. 7,000. 7,000 people is all that's left. It says, <clears throat> but they were paralyzed. Here's why you got to live like Elijah. Here's why you got to pray and obey and trust like Elijah because this is what happens. This is, this is a, 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 a picture, if you will, of what could happen here in America if we don't pay attention. It says that, but the, the Christians, the 7,000 was left, they were paralyzed with fear and they kept so still that the very existence, their very existence was unknown. See, they had put so much fear, Ahab and these other kings had put so much fear into the people that yes, they still believed, but they were paralyzed. They couldn't do anything. Church, I'm here to tell you, if we just come to church and we exist and we don't live like Elijah, we don't pray like Elijah, we don't obey like Elijah, we don't trust like Elijah, we will become paralyzed as a church. I'm telling you, we were this close two years ago from being paralyzed this time two years. If you go two years to now, the church would have been paralyzed. And I'm not preaching politics. I'm preaching the Bible. We would have been paralyzed, spiritually speaking, had the other candidate got in. And I'm, I'm, you can email me. I love you. I, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about our Christian rights and values. And we would be paralyzed. We are this close as it is. We got a little breathing room, but we're still in a fight. It's like a wrestler, you know, when they wrestle, they keep squeezing and squeezing. Look, we're still in the wrestling match. It's not over. You can't give up. We got to keep, we got to keep praying and obeying and trusting like Elijah or we'll be paralyzed as a church. It's time for us to get busy at being the church we're called to be. James was teaching them Hey, you got to live like Elijah. I know it's tough. I know the times were tough. I know he stood in the face of, of adversity. He stood in the face of, of, of the demons that said, I'll kill you today. I can have you uh, uh, annihilated right at the moment. Nobody will say a word. But he didn't care because he'd been praying. Then he started obeying. And when he stood in front of the king, he said, I'll trust you. I'll trust you with everything. I'll trust you with my life. I'll trust you with everything that I have. 
Are we willing to do that today? Are we really willing to trust and obey, and, I mean to pray, obey, and trust? Hallelujah. Somebody say praise the Lord. Verse 2 says, we're talking about praying, obeying, and trusting. Verse 2, 1 Kings 17, verse 2 says, Then the word of the Lord came to him. Now I put in my parentheses in, in my, as I was preparing this today, uh, prayer. H how does the word of the Lord come to you? How do you know what God wants you to do? You pray, you communicate, you commune, you, you have a dialogue with him. It's not, a, it's not a monologue. That's what we have reduced prayer to, by the way, uh, Pastor Andrew, is monologue. God, here's my list. Let me rack them off quick. I'm really busy. And when I get back home today at 5.30, 5.15, in between then and time me getting ready to do stuff with my kids, could you have those answered, please? <laughs> and we never dialogue with God. Dialogue's two ways. Monologue is just me, me and you. I'm saying it and that's it and we're done, let's go. Prayer is a two-way street. See, Elijah had been praying already. We don't see that in this text necessarily, but you and I know that prayer is a two-way street, right? So we have to conclude that he had been praying at some point prior. And so he says, and then the word of the Lord came to him. How many of you prayed for something, but it didn't happen right now? And, and a week from now, boom, there's, there, wow, there it is. You, or you pray for direction. Come on, you pray for guidance. And you didn't, it wasn't, you wasn't needed in. You just knew something may be coming up. So you're praying, you're praying, you're praying. And then when you need it, boom, the word of the Lord comes to you. So what he said, he'd already been praying. You're going to live like Elijah? going to pray like Elijah? He says, and the word of the Lord came to him saying, uh-oh, he gave him time to speak. There's the dialogue. He, he, I've given God time to speak to you. When you go into your prayer, I told you I'm going to teach and preach to you. When you go into your prayer time, tell God your needs. He's there for that. Well, why don't you wait on him a little bit? He might answer you right then. Amen. Amen. Verse 3 says, this is what he's telling him. <clears throat> verse 3, 17, 1 Kings 17, verse 3 says, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Corinth, which flows into the Jordan. And it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. Verse 5, so he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and stayed by the book Kareth, which flows into the Jordan. Now in my little parentheses, I put obey. Because look what happened. He heard from the Lord, he prayed and he heard from the Lord. The next thing is to obey. And he says, so he went. Here's the problem with a lot of the churches when we get to Matthew 28, 19, go ye into all the world, make disciples, we get to that and it says, sounds great, but we don't go. Well, my job really is to be a blessing financially. I'm going to give so they can go. My went's already got up and gone, so I'm going to stay here. He says, so he went. Watch. Now, this is cool. You need to listen to this. So he went and, is it up here? You get it? So he went and did. It's one thing to get your beautiful self up and come to church and learn, but it's another thing to do. Amen. It's another thing for you to do something with it. When God puts something in you, he didn't put it there so that you can just sit on it and say, well, I'm good. As my brother Billy says, it's just not fire insurance. He puts something in you. So if you're going to pray and hear from God, then you, you go and you do. So he went and he did what God told him to do. Well, what did God tell him to do? Verse, the two verses right before that. He said, you go there and you hang out. This is so cool. You hang out there and I've already commanded the ravens to feed you. I don't know about you, but I'm really thinking something a little different than a bird feeding me. <laughs> Nonetheless, if you're hungry... You really don't care what comes by or brings it by just as long as you can eat, right? Okay. So we'll make sure we're on the same page. Verse 6, the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. 
just as God said. You go over here. I know this is going to sound crazy, Elijah, but now I want you to go over here. You go to this certain place by this brook. I'm going to send some ravens by, and they're going to feed you. I know if, if, if Elijah's got thoughts like me, and the Bible says he does, I'm wondering, what kind of worm is this joker going to bring up to me? I ain't into worms. <laughs> you're not thinking a cake of bread, are you? Well, no, you're not. You're thinking, oh, man, nonetheless, Lord, whatever you want me to do. Now, that's obeying. Mm, well, I could preach right there just a minute on fasting. But I won't. I might drive some of us into fasting. Verse 6. The, uh, I'm going to read it again. Read it, uh, no, verse 7, I'm sorry. Verse 7, and it says, And it happened after a while, a time period, that the brook dried up. Imagine that. The brook dried up. Elijah already said, hey, it's finished quit raining. I don't know about y'all around here. Of course, we don't really in that, we're not in that problem right at the moment here in southeast Arkansas where we got a drought going on. <clears throat> but there's times when it gets really dry, right? And things, the ditches that normally have water in it and the bowels and stuff, they begin to dry up or get really shallow. And so he said, and, and this brook dries up. That's no surprise. That shouldn't be a surprise to Elijah, right? He's the one who says it's going to happen. So if God tells you to do something and you follow, don't be surprised when it, oh my gosh, uh, whew, my Lord didn't see that coming. <laughs> that, that caught me off guard. If you're going to live like Elijah, you've got to pray like him, you've got to obey like him, you've got to trust like him. It says, and it happened after a while the book dried up because there had been no rain in the land. You think? In parentheses, I put trust. Because see, we do pretty good at trusting the Lord as long as nothing really changes. Have you ever noticed? Lord, I want you to step out and do this. And as long as you move from this job to this job and you never miss a paycheck, we're pretty good. As long as you move from this location to this location, you got a nice home over here, you're still pretty good. It's when then you get in those moments where stuff begins to dry up. And you got to get out of your comfort zone. You got to get out of those things that, oh, I, I didn't know it was going to be this way. Now you got to start trusting. That's the hard part for Christians, believe it or not. I know everything we base, we base everything here on faith. Faith is basically trust. But it's hard for us to have faith. It's hard for us to trust the Lord. It's one of the hardest things in the Christian walk for me. I don't know about you. Maybe you got it down. If you do, <laughs> that's hard to trust the Lord. It's hard to trust the Lord when you're in high school thinking he's going to make a way. The only thing important to you is football or being on the cheerleading squad or whatever it is. It's hard, it's hard to trust God that says, look, I'm, I'm going to raise you up to be something mighty. It may not have anything to do with football or cheerleading or basketball. It might be a high school preacher on a campus. They don't trust God for that now. That's not that fun. Come on. So he says this in verse 7, or verse 8. So that's the trust part. So we've learned how he, he prayed, he obeyed, and he trusted. Now watch this. We're going to go on to verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, here it is again. This is, a, this is a pattern. We're going to learn over the next few weeks. This is a pattern that he prayed. And he obeyed and he trusted. He prayed. Verse 8. Verse 9 now it says, And arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Deja vu all over. Thank God there's a woman cooking for me now, though. <laughs> that bread, that bird was going to, I don't know where that beak's been, and I don't like it. I want a woman to be cooking for me. I mean, nothing wrong with men cooking. I'm just saying I like for a woman. You know, she got that. Mm, I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going somewhere I don't even need to be in. Here's a warning. Your prayer... And your obedience and trust might actually cause somebody to live. Your prayer and your obedience and your trust might actually cause somebody to have joy. Your prayer, your obedience, and your trust might actually lead somebody to Christ. Watch this. It's in Scripture. Verse 10. So he arose and went to Zarephath. Obey. Here we are. He done prayed. Now he's obeying again. He says he went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. 
I put in parentheses, trust. I mean, think about it. You, you've been by this brook for a while, and, and, and it went south on you, and the water dried up, and, and the Lord told you to go there, and you believed it, and you trusted him, you, you, you obeyed, and, and you trusted, and now he tells you to go to another place, and you go there, and he said there's going to be a widow that's going to take care of you. And he shows up, and lo and behold, the Bible, one translation says, and she was there. The indeed, I like, well, indeed so. I read the Bible different than most. Indeed, there was a widow there, you think? I mean, God said it. See, see I think Elijah now is getting this pattern. See, here's the difference between us and Elijah. This is how we get mixed up with Elijah. We, we, we want what he's experiencing now after second, third, fourth time of trusting him. We want that to happen right off the bat. See, we want to be in that mode when we go stand in front of Ahab. But see, sometimes you, you do that mighty, awesome work first, and then you trust. You obey, and you trust. Are you, are you with me? I've done some crazy things in my life that I thought was crazy, and now I look at it and say, thank you, Lord. Oh, that was you, Lord. It says, indeed, the widow was there gathering sticks. That's the trust part. And he called to her and said, this is, I don't know if you've ever read this, this is funny. He said, and he called her and said, please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, now can you imagine, well, let me just read on. And as she was going to get it, he called her and said, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread. Only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, it's going to get funny. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare the last supper for myself and my boy. I'm paraphrasing. That I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat and die. Watch. If you live like Elijah, you're going to pray like him, you're going to obey like him, and you're going to trust like him. Watch how he, what he does next. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. It's kind of, we're going to learn that's kind of the pot calling the kettle black in a few weeks. He says, do not fear. Go and do as you have said. What'd she say? I'm picking up sticks. I'm going to go make a meal and we're going to die. Go ahead and do that. That's what he's saying. Go ahead and do as you have said. But first, could you make me a cake? <laughs> I don't know about y'all, but in my house, if my wife wants me to do something, or she wants to do something first, that's going to get done first. I'm not going to say, okay, you can do that, but I need you to make me some eggs and bacon and and some waffles this morning. Her response, yeah, first. Her response is, first, let's get a few things straight. <laughs> you can cut that stove on like I cut that stove on. You can get them eggs like I, you, you get the point. That's funny to me. Elijah's there, he's on a mission from God. He knows he's on a mission from God. He's already prayed, he's already obeyed now. He's trusting and he sees this woman just as God had said. And he, she says, I'm gonna get some sticks. I'm gonna make a meal and we're gonna eat and die. And he says, well, go ahead and do that, but first make me a cake. Oh, and by the way, while you're making a cake, make one for you and the boy. That's what it says. Make one for you and the boy. See, he's already speaking a prophetic word and to somebody says, if you're gonna live, she ain't got it yet though. That's what I'm trying to do today. I'm trying to, I'm trying to speak something into your life that if you'll pray and you'll obey and, and you'll trust God, things will happen in your life that you didn't expect. The things will begin to change that you thought was a hopeless situation. If you'll begin to pray and obey and trust God for what you've been praying for, what you've been thinking about, guess what? Things will change in your life. It may come the oddest way, though. It may come by somebody you don't know, AJ. It may come by that person, come by and give you a word, and that's the word you needed. If it lines up with the word, you can trust it. If it doesn't line up with the word, 
Throw that over your shoulder and move on. They just missed it. It's okay. Not a person in the world had missed it giving a word for somebody. <gasps> really? Uh-huh. Mm, that'll preach too. Hallelujah. Okay, now watch this. I'm going to hurry. And Elijah said, I'm going to read verse 13. And Elijah said to her, do not fear, go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterward, make some for you, yourself and your son. Prayer, obedience, and trust combined, watch this, combined will allow you to make statements like I'm fixing them read. Prayer, obedience, and trust, when you combine those two, when you walk in those will result in what I'm fixing to show you in verse 14. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, when you pray and you obey and you trust God, you can speak with authority to a situation, to a person, to a thing, to your life, to what's going on. You can speak because you've already been praying, you've obeyed, and you already trust God for what you're after. You want to live like Elijah? Pray, obey, and trust. It says for this... Uh, for the bin of flour, this is what he makes. This is a statement that he makes. The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends the rain on the earth. Oh, she didn't know. All she knew, there was a drought. She probably didn't know that Elijah was the man who started the drought because she had been mad taking a stick after him. <laughs> I mean, I know I am, right? I mean, we're, it's so dry, we're fixing to die. My God, sounds like some church houses. It's so dry, we finna die. That'll preach too. Give me a pen. Notice right there, that's another title. It's another message. Seriously. It's so dry, they're about to die. I'm, man, I'm mad now. I'm mad. Elijah knows she's not a, look, she ain't happy. You ain't never ask a woman to do something first when she's giving you that kind of statement. She's not happy. She's mad. As my dad, she, she's mad in old wet hen. She's mad. But because he'd been praying and obeying and trusting God, he knew, hey, guess what? I'm fixing to give you a word, and you can stand on the word. That flower you got is not going to run out. That oil is not going to run dry. I'm telling you, when God says something, and you've been praying and obeying and trusting, and you know it's a word from God, you can stand on it. You don't have to worry about it. You can stand on it because I'm here to tell you it's going to come to pass. The Lord's given me some stuff before, spoke specifically to me, and I've stood on it. I can go back and pinpoint from years ago exactly what the Lord spoke to me, and it happened just that way. Now, I'm not telling you to dream something up in your intellectual mind that you want to happen. Because you're going to get upset. You're going to be mad. And you're going to say, well, that preacher told me this, and I'm mad at him. I ain't never going back to church again. Well, that's your business. Get your sticks and go on die. <laughs> I'm just saying, pray, obey, and trust. Mm, I feel the Holy Ghost in there. Verse 15 says, so he went away. Honey, we come to the piano. So he went away and did according to the word of or so she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. What was that? She made the cake, got him some water, done exactly what she was told to do in the order in which she was told to do. She began to obey and trust what the man of God had said would come to pass. So you mean to tell me that if I obey and I trust, that unlocks something with God? Absolutely. Some of you come into this church service today and you've never, you, you didn't know why you came. You don't even know why you're here. You showed up. You didn't pray about coming to church this morning. You didn't pray about where you are eternally. You just showed up at church, Bubba. You just showed up. get to pass in some situations the prayer if you start obeying what the Holy Spirit is doing in your heart and you start trusting that he will save you and that he wants to save you you can do those two first and then go back to the prayer and say Lord would you come into my heart will you come into my life with I want to make you Lord Master and Savior does that make any sense 
sometimes you just have to step out and, and obey. God, I know you told me, and I'm trusting, I'm trusting you, Lord. Trusting you. I'm trusting you, God, that you're going to perform what you said in your word. I'm trusting you, God, that it is your will that every man be saved. I'm trusting you, God, that you want me to be saved. I'm trusting you, God, that you want me to draw closer to you. Verse 16 says, And the bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. I'm going to give you a nugget right here. Not everybody that speaks something in your life is by the word of God. Some people speak into your life and it, they don't even know how to spell God. That's why you got to pray. You got to read your Bible. You got to study. You got to obey. You got to trust the Lord. You got you to serve Him. You got to be in tune with Him. So when somebody does give you a word, you can trust that word or you can throw it away. Church, this is so important for us today to learn to live like Elijah. You got to live like Elijah. So much, so much volume, so much mass right here in these scriptures. We all want to live like Elijah from the first time he was mentioned in 1 Kings chapter 17. But are we willing to pray? Elijah prayed before you heard his name before you heard anything about him are you willing to go into your closet are you willing to go into your prayer room and are you willing to pray and when you get past that first step of praying when you pray and you think you've heard from God are you willing to obey and do what he says to do because if you're not you spend some time in a closet for nothing you just Is Elijah and so he went and did as the Lord commanded. so I'm here to tell you that if you'll pray and you'll obey that will lead you into trusting God amen it's time church that we quit playing church that we stop after the prayer We ain't got any problem praying. Call we ain't got any problem praying. We pray, glory to God, we can pray. Look, we can pray you our problems all week. That's when we stop. Do you understand that where prayer and obedience and trust at the crossroads of those three things, do you understand that's where miracles happen? Do you understand that's where lives are changed? Do you understand that's where we come from being a church to being a church alive? Do you understand that th at that crossroads is where things begin to happen that you only read about years ago or that you're reading that somebody else is doing? But at that moment, at that crossroads of the prayer, the obedience, and the trust, life begins to change. See, Elijah could have prayed and left it there. He could have prayed and, and went, but did nothing and still been powerless. But because he trusted, he coupled those three. I just got to believe this this morning that somebody's here looking for a God to do something in your life that you think is impossible. Probably right now you're already saying, well, I've already prayed about it. But have you obeyed about it? And have you trusted him for it? My daddy told me a long time ago, son, sometimes you got to put some legs on your prayers. And I believe that. God will orchestrate some things, but see, Elijah had to do the same thing. He prayed and he had to get up and go do something. You're in this room today. You say, you don't know what I'm faced with.
pastor I'm faced with depression I'm faced with uh, anxiety I, I am faced with so many things I'm, I don't even know if I'm even saved well I want to tell you something there's good news and the king the righteous king is in the house he's here today and guess what you're at a crossroads where people have been praying where people have been obeying where people have been trusting God for you today. We don't, we don't necessarily know who you are, but I tell you, I pray for every week. I pray for people. I pray for people that's going to come in this room. And I say, Lord, I don't know who they are. I don't know what they're coming with. It's irrelevant that I even know them or know what they're here for. But God, if they're here today, will you massage their heart with the Holy Spirit? Will you pull them? Lord, because when you touch them, it'll be meaningful. So if you're here today, you've already been prayed for. The Holy Spirit has already been released to move in your life. Just obey. Just obey. What is it God's wanting you to do? Is He wanting you to surrender completely? that's one of the biggest challenges, Ralph, that we surrender completely to God. With every head bowed and every eye closed.